All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Reach New Heights. In the next 30 minutes, we'll walk you through the seven common phases of a new company. My name is Erin Gilbert, and I will be your moderator, along with Phil Dunn. We are part of the marketing department for Onboard Informatics, today's leader in local data and content, and the company behind Startup Wars, a program that has helped many startup brands this past year. I'm joined by two very special guests. First, Mark Seiden, founder of Onboard Informatics, who joins us to speak to some of his own experiences starting his company back in 2001. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We are also joined by Adapia De Erico, who is employee number one and the chief marketing officer at Patch of Land, a very exciting new company offering a peer-to-peer -peer real estate crowd financing platform. Adapia started with the company three months after it launched and brings with her the experience and knowledge of being involved in a startup at a very strategic level. Welcome, Adapia. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Mark and Adapia both offer wonderful perspectives on the challenges and triumphs of starting a new company. Starting a new company is a lot like taking flight. You will need a flight plan, runway, you will need to take off, and once you do, quickly ascend to greater heights with a little tailwind. There will inevitably be some turbulence, but hopefully a fair share of smooth sailing. And this is what we'll touch on today. We'll be asking Mark and Adapia for their insights and advice on each phase, so you leave with some good hints as you navigate your own company's success. As we move through today, if you have any questions or comments, please use the comment feature at the top of your uh, screen, that little comment bubble uh, at the top. Type your questions and send it to at host. We will address any questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation itself will but we will leave some time at the end for your questions and also a little bit of open discussion. So if you have the time, please do stick around. And with that, let's begin. Phil will kick things off with the first phase of any company, the plan. Thank you, Erin. So uh, with developing a flight plan or a business plan, it really doesn't have to be expensive at the beginning of your company. It just needs to answer some critical questions like what product or service your business provides, how your customers will use it, and what your competitive landscape looks like. An article that I would highly recommend would be to develop a one-paragraph startup plan which is featured in Entrepreneur Magazine. And uh, with that, Mark, when, it, when Onboard was starting up, how did you develop your business plan? Uh, well, we didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, in all seriousness, I, I, I think there's an inverse correlation between your ultimate vision and what needs to get done today, uh, you know, which is getting, uh, as we uh, draw an analogy, getting the plane off the ground. And what we found is, you know, very short, quick, um, attainable goals over a 90-day period, uh, you know, just a couple of milestones to hit, um, and then, you know, kind of doing a retrospective on what you did, and then create another 90-day plan. Uh, we all know time goes by very quickly, but most importantly, as you start to uh, sew these together, before you know it, um, you've done this over a year, and you've hit more milestones than you've missed. I've seen a lot of great uh, entrepreneurs or a lot of great thinkers create a mountain, uh, you know, and that can uh, certainly uh, curtail growth, which is so important at the early stages of, of a company. That's great advice. To not over plan, to focus on what's happening now and around the corner. And Adapia, what are some things that you're finding at Patch of Land that you really can't plan for? So with Patch of Land, um, we've been finding that uh, regulatory changes, because we work in a business that is highly regulated, even though um, uh, we specifically aren't uh, held to as many regulations as banks, let's say, but we still need to be aware of those regulatory changes, what's going on even at the level of Congress. Um, so those are some changes that while we can kind of expect them, we also can't. So the best thing to do is know what the what could potentially happen and have some penciled in plans knowing that it's either going to be A, B, or C. Um, and another one uh, for us could be really economic changes uh, that in real estate. Like that's a big, that's a big thing. So there's some major um, 
major hurdles that you can't really plan for, but uh, at least being aware of them is extremely important. Um, so having a path and knowing what the obstacles could be, because nowadays you really can understand a lot more than uh, what might have been possible even just a few years ago. Right. I think that's great advice that everyone can take away from this, that the purpose of having this one paragraph startup plan is really to enable that fluidity and readiness for unexpected challenges that you really can't plan for. I would also add that it's additionally necessary to have that adaptability when you enter our next phase, which is the runway. Erin, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Proof of concept is uh, key in this phase. Uh, because this is your idea and your passion, it can be tempting to develop your business in a vacuum. But feedback from your early adopters and improve your business plan based on their reaction will ensure you can take off before the end of your runway. Uh, Pia, have, how have you utilized client feedback in your development process? We actually use client feedback a lot. Like you said, um, those early adopters are fundamental. Uh, and if you're running a business that's maybe more of a fan business, let's say, um, those, uh, th those people become your advocates. Uh, and they become your lead generation tools as well in a certain sense. So we definitely use our client feedback. Uh, we have some very sophisticated, very intelligent people that we, we actively solicit for advice on what they think about what we're doing, and we do implement it, I mean, insofar as possible. There is a test plan, there are processes, um, there are timelines, but uh, we've used their feedback on everything from loan structure to even types of products we might look into in the future tech enhancements, and essentially we're relying on um, our customers' feedback to create a better product experience and ultimately a better business. That's awesome, using your clients as lead generation tools. I like that. Um, Mark, when did you know that Onboard was getting the response you wanted from clients? Well, we're 13 years old, and, and uh, I still inspire all of us, uh, even myself, uh, to you know, not accept the fact, not accept the fact that we have not reached that ultimate goal. And while that sounds like a perfectionist, uh, I do think uh, that process, you know, is is a work in, in progress. But there are wins along the way that you know we do appreciate and that we take in. As Adapi, you know, very aptly pointed out, is by soliciting and taking that feedback, um, you can, you know, make adjustments and, or most importantly, look yourself in the mirror and say this might not have come out the way we wanted or clients are not at the level that we wanted them to be. Um, but when they come up to me or, or you know, one of us at Onboard at a show and said, hey, thanks for your level of service or I'm using this product and it's really helping my business, that's something that we circulate internally and that we, uh, we celebrate because, again, that's what we inspire you know, to do here. We, we all want to be very proud of what we do, it's not. It's not a. Uh, um, it's not just a fact of putting out a product, making some revenue, and hoping it sticks. You really need to be closer uh, to the best on that. Mm -hmm. So actively soliciting feedback and then reacting accordingly sounds like good advice for the runway. Uh, our next phase is also a good one: lift off. So. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. So phase three, taking off, is when your business is starting to begin generating revenue and you begin developing your brand's infrastructure. Some great things to prioritize in this phase include a good website, a logo, a dedicated email address, and all these elements are meant to lend integrity to your brand and really make it easier for your customers to trust the products and services that you're providing. And one key piece in today's day and age is, of course, the website, which is often the storefront of any brand or concept. Uh, Mark, what was the biggest challenge you faced in launching Onboard? Uh, well, when we launched Onboard, we, we, we started in a basement so I could still see our um, our website with a spinning globe on it. It was actually uh, a web page, but really taking all of our concept and excuse me, our, our concept and, and and translating that in, into something tangible with limited uh, you know with, with limited assets was our biggest challenge. And uh, as all of us startups know you have one choice, and that's, that's to be scrappy. And we literally started going door to door to make people aware that we were there. And eventually that caught on, and we took a little bit of revenue, and we built that web page into 
more of a website and, and then added other assets along the way. And it's just like a viral video goes around. It starts somewhere and then it gains momentum. And you have to start with that first view, you know, that first page, that first knock on the door, and just take it methodically one step at a time. Yeah, I like that you pointed that out, that it's really taking that one paragraph plan from the flight plan and developing it into an actual concept. And it doesn't all happen at once. It happens continuously uh, as it starts to develop. And organically over time, yeah. Absolutely. Adapia, when it comes to creating this concept and taking off with it, how do you utilize your website to gain insights to your customers and make improvements internally? Yeah, we use the website a lot. I mean, it's literally uh, and figuratively for us a portal. Um, and I just wanted to quickly say the onboard site, Mark, my favorite part of it is actually the blog. Um, and as a marketer, it's potentially the most important page uh, on your website in a lot of ways to attract and retain uh, people who come to it, and I actually go weekly and check out what you guys are writing. So, um, Very cool. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, and, you know, even for us, actually, uh, the, the blog's a big part of it um, from a content marketing strategy. And so we use, we've uh, we've been tracking some really good results on the blog in addition to where we see people going on the website, um, where they hover, how long they spend, um, where, where they drop off, et cetera. So there are some highly, um, let's call them advanced analytics, if you will, versus um, just having a sense of what people are doing. And today's technology and apps and services can allow you to do that. Uh, and so what we try and do with, um, with the website analytics as we see them is turn that over into communications um, for our customers. And so we tweak the site. Um, for example, did we put the call to action too high up the page or too far down the page? Um, you know, is the site, is it optimized for SEO? And are you on top of all of those changes, which uh, are incredibly, um, they just incredibly fluctuate uh, nowadays, especially. So you have to constantly monitor um, that in conjunction with what we were talking about before, being uh, staying in, in contact with um, with your customer. So you're looking at multiple channels. And, um, you know, for us, it, it really does come down to tailoring communication according to those findings and um, trying to be as informative as possible, uh, educating and building trust and validation. Uh, you know, like Mark said, you're going out and you're doing the handshakes and uh, you're, you're building trust on a personal level, and your website has to reflect that as well. I just, I'm sorry to interject. I also wanted to add, you know, a website is a medium, uh, you know, one of several that we can communicate. Obviously, a uh, platform approach for some startups is essential, even if you're starting at the app phase and then converting yeah. to a website, what we're suggesting is whatever medium you're communicating that you utilize some of the things that we're talking about. Definitely, and I think that's a really resourceful way to maximize what anyone would agree is the startup's most important tool. Uh, Aaron, would you like to tell us about how brands can, can go past this phase and ascend? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, hopefully by this point in the company you're generating some revenue, and at this point PR and marketing can help take your company to the next level. PR is a great tool for new companies because it can maximize exposure without spending a ton of money. And while PR might mean dropping press releases, it can also include things today like pitching speaking opportunities, entering contests, or even content. Um, Mark, I know you value PR, which is one of the reasons that Startup Wars program you created includes these PR opportunities. Uh, what are some of the more successful PR initiatives you've seen with your clients? Yeah, so uh, great, you know, great question, and I think uh, an important and, and uh, you know, kind of growing phenomenon, if you will. When we started, and it's not that we're not that we're even that old, but I feel, you know, saying 13 years ago is is dinosauric. But we didn't have uh, some of the tools that we had today. I mean, social media wasn't really, uh, you know, it was probably in its thought process uh, back then. But you know, today, as other people talked about um, blog posts thought leadership, um, you know, getting uh, your expertise out there, you know, through various mediums, whether, you know, it is dropping some press releases, speaking on panels, commenting um, in positive ways on blogs, you know, letting other thought leaders know that you're reading and you're sharing, um, you know, in, in their thought process, that could become very viral and very effective as, 
you know, people look um, for, you know, folks they want to trust in business, you know, they're going to look for those thought leaders, uh, you know, first. And that's, it's great to get, you know, your name out there. Excellent. Um, Autopia, I know you also emphasize a little thought leadership in your approach. Uh, what has been some of the more successful PR or marketing efforts you've seen at uh, Patch of Land? So we've taken a really integrated approach to the marketing, uh, and our PR centers around events. Um, and taking that thought leadership and becoming um, a leader also from the perspective of being part of the discourse, um, shaping that discourse, speaking with other thought leaders and other, uh, other people in your industry or maybe even other industries, um, and always, I would say, always contributing valuable, interesting, and informative content and points, uh, not just agreeing for the sake of agreeing or saying the same things, even if, you're, uh, even if your competitors do almost exactly the same thing, you have a different viewpoint. Um, and that's something that really comes out in the approach. Um, if that means showing up at an event and doing something a little differently, whether it's from display or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, something even like a T-shirt, I mean, it can be anything. Just put your own flavor into it. Um, and then continue that conversation. Again, we're always going back to this, the blog or an email nurture campaign or just generally the communication. But keep, um, keep your flavor and your uniqueness always uh, top of mind. Outstanding. So unique approach is, is important and continuing the conversation. Excellent advice. Um, as you ascend, it's nice to have a little tailwind, which is the next phase. So we'll introduce. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. When it feels like things have sold out, a larger, more established brand can definitely give your small starting up company a boost or some tailwind. When you partner with established companies or events, you can gain exposure with key players in those brands, which can lead to introductions, promotions, and networking opportunities. And Mark, I know that you're a big believer in this. Through Startup Wars, participants have been able to forge partnerships and business opportunities with larger brands. But for Onboard, how did they work with larger companies when they started out early on? Well, uh, we, we, um, we, we went, I think, a little crazy in the beginning instead of, uh, well, we went for the biggest clients we can you know, find. And so we went a little crazy and we got very lucky, I have to say. Some of our um, initial clients were, were large market leaders. And there in itself, their names and, and their market uh, leader presence uh, gave us uh, almost instant credibility. And, and that's, I think, again, uh, what people look for, like, is this an established company or how can I trust them? Uh, or is their product something that, you know, that's viable? And if you attach that to, uh, you know, a market leader, that gives you credibility. The other way we, we would leverage is uh, obviously, you know, using some of these uh, trade shows and what have you to make as, um, as a forum to meet as many people uh, as, as possible. And uh, it's really great when you know we can get out there and 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 leverage uh, a technology show where just all of your peers are going to be there uh, to make those type of connections. Well, definitely, I think that that experience, especially that we had or uh, starting out early on, it really speaks to the volume and impact that larger brands can have on startups, which I think even relates to today. Uh, Autopia, I know that you've landed a lot of really great speaking opportunities to patch a land, including Finnovate, which I know that's where you are right now. Are there any tricks to drafting an effective uh, pitch that can gain this kind of exposure? Um, I think a real key point um, for, for pitching anything is to be really 100% certain on what your story is and what you're offering. So going back to that one paragraph plan, if you have that solid um, you can really pitch anything, and knowing who you're pitching to is really important. So, yeah, we're here at Finnovate. We're presenting our technology. It's a very specific kind of conference. Um, we don't go to, for example, a Wall Street con conference and pitch technology. We're, we're pitching a different part of the business. Um, so, ultimately, if you're prepping any kind of communication, always put yourself in or the perspective of the person you're pitching to. Um, and as just like an added thing that uh, is really important to me anyways, and I'm finding that we get this, uh, we get this feedback a lot, is be humble and be respectful. Uh, there, that's something that gets overlooked sometimes when you're a startup and you're really excited or you have a charismatic leader. Um, but when you're, when you're talking to anyone, um, 
that that's a, something of, of a mindfulness that really, really helps. Um, and it's gotten us uh, quite far. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's something that most startups, not even startups, but companies can really take away from this is that you want to be as helpful to your audience as possible, and that's probably going to result in as many speaking opportunities as possible as well. Uh, so, Erin, why don't you take us into our next phase, which is turbulence. Yeah, the dreaded phase. Um, turbulence is inevitable as your company takes flight. So while you can't anticipate everything that might happen, it's important to be nimble enough to adjust and keep flying. Two things can create rough air. The first, weather conditions might be outside forces or circumstances out of your control that directly affect your company. When you're in the real estate business, for example, something like the subprime mortgage crisis in 2007 can definitely have an impact. Uh, Mark, what advice would you give to stay nimble through rough weather that will inevitably come? Yeah, um, we've certainly had uh, an interesting, challenging time, and I think you know historically all startups will hit uh, you know some type of turbulence. This was uh, pretty severe for all of us, and I think you know really adaptability uh, is uh, you know your your best friend, and, and what that means is that uh, you know while it's fairly academic that we're in an economic downturn, the question is. Uh, you know, what do you do about it? We were very proactive uh, in speaking with our clients uh, to let them know that, you know, hey, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, we took some proactive measures to make adjustments, uh, whether it be product-wise or financially or what have you, um, to, you know, kind of back the words that we spoke. And, uh, you know, this really cemented a lot of great relationships. Uh, I think it got us closer to our customers. Uh, I think it helped us and them weather the storm. I think uh, while we did lose customers, we lost far less than I think a company that you know didn't make the phone calls or didn't anticipate that their customers might be looking for economic relief. And that's just you know one example. Uh, you know there are flip sides to that as well. But certainly in negative times, uh, you really need to you know be out in front of that. That's great. So be adaptive and be proactive. Um, Adapia, have you encountered any unanticipated outside forces uh, that made you shift things within your organization? We did. Um, what we've uh, what we've actually encountered has been um, the explosive growth of the industry that we're in, and it actually caught us by surprise to some extent, um, where we just had this huge influx of for us institutional investors that want to come to the platform. Um, and it does present um, a form of turbulence um, because if you're a marketplace or any business, really, um, you have to maintain a balance. And so sometimes this turbulence isn't necessarily uh, like negative, like an economic downturn, but sometimes if you, you can have these, these hits that um, – they actually make you double down. So we doubled down on the strategy because we, we got the feedback that this is something that people really want and we had to get extremely focused um, and stay the course. And because it's easy also to get distracted. Like, oh, maybe you can do this over here and why don't you go into that category over there? And everything looks wonderful when, when, when people think you're, you can do anything. Um, but do you have the resources to do that? Is it actually part of even your initial business plan? So um, it, really, it really requires you to be more focused than before and also just take it in stride um, because it could also just be like turbulence, actually. It could be a passing thing. Uh, luckily for us, it's not, but, you, you know, not, not to get carried away sometimes with um, being like a, a – Well, I think that's a great point as far as yeah. I, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I think I love your point about you know the positive side of that Adapia. I think that you know it's that uh, careful what you wish for. There's that that uh, UPS commercial that was on several years back of that startup that you know got the one order and then before you knew it, it was ten thousand orders and they couldn't fulfill it. And you know that's a great problem to have, but it's a a, a, a negative one if you can't fulfill that. So you you watch your dreams fall apart based on something that could have been positive. So great contrast to, you know, the, the point I made. Appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. And actually, I just wanted to add quickly just to go back on that, too, is that if you do that, um, if you go for, for that, that big, uh, let's say that big client over there, 
don't forget those clients or those customers that were with you from the beginning. Uh, I've seen this happen. It, it's like the musician that gets famous and then leaves his girlfriend or, you know, forgets about his original friends. Like those people that were with you from the very beginning, they matter more than anybody else. No matter who else comes along, um, never forget those ones because they they believed in you and they trusted you and you can't break their trust. Great point. The other thing that can impact a smooth flight is pilot error. Um, and these are common mistakes any business owner can make. Uh, Mark, not to put you on the spot, but what are some of the biggest mistakes you made early on with Onboard and what did you learn from them? I thought we described before what a perfectionist I was. Uh, so, I mean, I think to, to, to you know to put it into just a, a concise statement, I think is, and as entrepreneurs and fellow entrepreneurs out there, uh, the same you know kind of tenacity and uh, work ethic and drive, passion, ego, wh- whatever we need to get that plane off the ground, uh, can actually be the same ingredients to crash the same plane. And I think that uh, sometime along the way, while we we might be startup folks, we might not have um, faced certain operational issues or people issues. And because we're so used to have have done it before on our own, we kind of attack all the problems the same way. And we learn that uh, that's just not the case. You have to be able to back off and say, hey, I haven't really seen this before. There are people out there that have seen this many times that can come in and help us out, and it's kind of just lowering your defenses to, you know, asking for help and recognizing that you can't do everything along the way. And we did find out the hard way, uh, you know, but certainly a, a lesson learned and hope to pass it on to other entrepreneurs. Outstanding point. Um, yeah. So once, hopefully, you weather this rough air, um, the go- ultimate goal is the final phase that we'll discuss today, which is sailing. So most companies aren't setting out to land their plane or have an exit strategy, per se, in the first few years of business. So the ultimate goal of any startup is usually to have a smooth sailing flight. Mark, what single piece of advice would you give to ensure smooth sailing for early stage startups? Um, so, great question, uh, and I think, uh, you know, very important as we just kind of look back at all these great topics you, you guys asked us about today. Uh, you know, we talked about these 90-day chunks, but, uh, you know, you really need uh, an effective plan in place uh, that is going to uh, carry you forward. And, you know, once you have a plan, you know, people talk about execution all the time. You can execute on the wrong plan and you might get, an ex- you know, an execution, but you're not anywhere you know, further down the road. So the plan has to be right, and obviously you need the right people doing the right things to execute that plan. And that plan will create hopefully a product or a service that the market has told you they want. And that is not static. That has to remain a dynamic, uh, you know, uh, organism, if you will. That's where you're constantly tweaking, soliciting feedback, as Adapia, uh, you know, uh, discussed before and making sure that you continue to bring value to your customers to, uh, to the market. Uh, do not be afraid to ask for advice along the way. That will ensure that during times that could get turbulent, you're being proactive about you know, flying around the storm, if you will. And one last piece of advice to all of us who bury ourselves in our offices because we feel we need to be there operating all day long, get out of your office and meet people and talk to them and evangelize your passion and, and make sure that you're not just spending the time in the weeds. You need to be out there being the face and the voice of your company. This will help you grow uh, in more ways than you can imagine. Definitely. So overall, never being tied to your thought process or being adaptable and never being tied to your desk, whether that's in the runway stage or receiving feedback or in the turbulent stage with some unexpected weather conditions. Great. So, Adapia, I actually have the same question for you. Yeah, I echo everything uh, that Mark said. I mean, especially the getting out part, um, and I'll elaborate that on that a little more because especially if you're the co-founders or, like, early leadership, um, it's so important for you 
to go out there and be the voice and the face because nobody else can do that for you. Um, if you're shy, you're going to have to get over it. Um, you're you're going to find a way to do it. I mean, nobody is going to sell this for you. It's great to have – I mean, you want to hire the right people that can – and do things while you go out and build the business on a very different level. Um, and to that end as well, make sure if you're co-founders that you're all on the same page all the time. So go back to that original business plan, even if it is a paragraph. What is your product or service? What is the need that you're trying to fulfill? Who are your customers? So keeping that focus, um, staying on the path, essentially. Um, and as leadership, as co-founders and founders, you have to set that path and make sure that essentially you're really flying that plane and everybody that's on it. Yeah, definitely. I don't think that the impact of maintaining your company culture and your unified mindset amongst your staff can really be overstated. Really a great advice out of here. So that's the seven phases of any startup and how you can excel through each phase. I know that Aaron wanted to share with you the inspiration behind today's webinar, and following that we'll take some questions. Aaron? Perfect. The inspiration for this webinar um, was the anniversary of Onboard Startup Wars program. Mark started this program a year ago, and Autopia is actually involved through Patch of Land. The program offers new companies discounts and support as they lift off. Uh, Mark, what was the inspiration of you creating Startup Wars? Well, I mean, simply put, uh, we were a startup ourselves, and uh, during that time, uh, you know, we struggled through. Uh, you know, those 90-day cycles, there are many times that, you know, we um, get to the next day. And a lot of that had to do with, um, you know, cash flow uh, in and out. And, um, you know, some people gave us some breaks along the way that, that, that really helped us out. Uh, secondly, uh, companies like Trulia and Zillow, Redfin, they were just starting out when we were as well. And we can see what, you know, they've grown into. And while we don't ask for equity in these companies, that you know that we're getting involved with certainly uh, our mo here is to um, you know launch with great companies like uh, Patch of Land, uh, support them the way you know the way we can, learn from them the way we can, and grow a true partnership you know into the future. And as they aspire to be you know the next big story we read about um, you know in In Men or or on the, to the cover of the New York Times, and it's just something that comes very naturally to us, and it's uh, an honor to work with uh, folks like Adapia and her company and some of the other startup work participants. Outstanding. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about the program, feel free to reach out to me or Phil or simply visit startupwars.com. We're always looking for great partners. Um, that concludes the prepared portion of the webinar, but we wanted to take a moment and see if the audience had any questions that we might want to answer, and also perhaps just open up the discussion a little bit uh, between Adapia and Mark, if you guys had any questions perhaps for each other. Um, I don't have a question maybe specifically, but I did want to um, continue on Mark's point. Like we really enjoy being part of the program um, and I've seen you and your team sort of at work doing the networking at, at and then at the event um, where I came in and I mean it's it, it's nothing short of impressive and even for us you know stay at Finnovate like you know guess who we mentioned on stage as our data source right I mean it's a it's a natural you know it's a natural kind of evolution of, of that of that partnership and Getting those strategic partnerships, whether you're the startup or whether you're the established company, it just adds so much value. Um, and as a marketer, I'm always fighting going ROI on things. Um, partnerships sometimes can be uh, difficult to show, to show that return on investment uh, immediately, but over time, they're definitely worth it. So if you're if you're a startup, um, you know, go find those partners because they really add a ton of value. Mark, did you have any um, just, uh, So just, I guess, some background. How, um, whether I know this or not, just some context for the audience. I don't know if we mentioned it. How, um, how old is, is Patch of Land right now? So we're just 11 months old. Uh, we launched our first loan uh, a year ago in October. Wow. Yeah. That's a, I've come a long way. And how many employees now? Now we're 12 full-time um, and 17 with uh, interns and part-time staff. So it, it sounds so familiar. And, and <laughs> you know, it's that first, you know, that statistic in the first year, and then you, 
get by the first year, and we're not at smooth sailing yet, but certainly now you have a full year to look back and, and say, well, you know, it's an anniversary, and now we yeah. can start looking forward beyond 90 days, although you always want to have 90-day plans, but <clears throat> what can we look forward to this year? And you start look, worrying about space and telecommunications and, you know, shows and travel and a whole bunch of things that you couldn't think of or, or really execute on in the first year. And before you know it, you look around and there's 42 people and so yeah. forth. <laughs> yeah. Really, really yeah, and it, it helps, too, like the track record um, to look back and say, you know, oh, my gosh, like at the beginning of June we were – or in May, we were four people, and then how did that happen? Um, and it's a lot of fun, and, and it's like the company is irrecognizable. Like every couple of weeks, we look back and say, oh, my gosh, like look what's going on. And, and it is. It's, uh, it's really fantastic. Um, and it's always good to, like, clock those little wins, like the little little milestones. Um, big milestones are fantastic, but the little ones also, I find, um, and they're worth celebrating. Um, especially for team building and for keeping that culture alive. Um, and, uh, I mean, I don't know. You guys have a really fun office over there, and, and you seem like you have a lot of fun. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's nice. you got to keep people engaged on so many different levels, like especially when you're building that, that company. I mean, you guys are pretty big now, so you can imagine uh, a little harder. Yeah, well, uh, and just maybe as a final point to touch on culture, because I think that's what brings – brings it all together. Uh, it's very important for my partner, John Bednarsh, and I uh, that people feel like they're coming to a place where they feel empowered, respected, uh, that, you know, their peers are, are, are their partners, not, you know, trying to get their jobs, and that, um, you know, it's very cliche, work hard, play hard, but that we, you know, we take what we do very seriously. We take a huge amount of pride in what, what we output. And we, we recently did a company team building event. And, um, you know, I, I look at it maybe a little differently than somebody who's attending, but uh, I just was beaming, you know, ear to ear, seeing everybody getting along, having a great time, letting loose, just having fun, um, and, you know, just really speaking and feeling positive about the environment. I can't tell you, anyone, how, how far that goes in terms of a positive work environment where people just feel great coming to work every day so important. Yeah. Some awesome takeaways from everyone today. Um, I want to thank our very special guest, Mark Seiden, founder of Onboard Informatics and Adapia de Erico, Chief Marketing Officer of Patch of Land. I want to thank Phil Dunn from Onboard Marketing for his assistance today and to all of you for joining us. Uh, this concludes Reach New Heights. Thanks again and have a great day. Adapia, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Mark. You too, Aaron. Phil, thank you.